Hello guys and welcome to part 4 of my DIY milling machine project, where I'm going to show you how I built myself a working milling machine from scratch. In the last three parts I built a column, the spindle and the belt drive. This part will be focused on the z-axis and the xy table. Let's start with the table then. I bought this xy table from Amazon. The first thing I did was to disassemble the whole thing and I really recommend that you are doing the same thing if you get one of these cheap import ones. Why? Because they really are built to a low price. Having said that, they are a good starting point though. Mainly because they are made of cast iron and the dovetails are quite ok as well. A lot of the edges of machine surfaces need to be deburred and the screws have some kind of gunk inside the threads. Also the threads have metal chips still hanging on their ends. Nothing a small file and some cleaning can't fix though. I then gave all the parts, especially the machine dovetails and the threads, a good clean down with brake cleaner to get rid of all the grinding dust that settled on the parts. When putting everything back together I put a light film of oil onto the machine surfaces and the threads. Also I put some grease on the inside of the bushings. Now we are left with a quite solid and clean table for its price. One side note, I designed the whole mill around this table, so this was one of the first things I got for it. Let's go ahead to the Z axis then. The first thing I did was to mount the two linear rails onto the milled surface of the column. Then I proceeded to get the rails parallel to the axis of the spindle. For this I put a very straight and dimensional accurate 20mm shaft into my collet holder. Also I mounted one of the carriages onto the left rail. I then proceeded to move it up and down while measuring the deviation with a dial indicator. My goal here was to get within 0.1mm of deviation. The same thing happened to the right rail as well. After that I mounted another carriage to the right rail and connected both carriages with a piece of flat steel to see if they would bind up, which luckily they don't. To keep the carriages from falling off the rails I added these stopping blocks. Would be a nightmare if the steel balls would fall out of them. By the way I totally forgot to put this in part 2, but here you can see the run out of the spindle measured on the collar chuck. Let's call it one and a half hundredths of a millimeter. With the rails adjusted I was finally ready to make the mill's knee. So I started to cut the parts for the knee frame out with an angle grinder. Now I was left with four main parts. After that I tack welded all parts together. Once I was happy with the squareness of the parts I welded everything together with proper weld beads. The only exception was the top plate. It will later be screwed in position. I only tack welded it here because it acts as a reference surface for the other three plates. That way I can come close to a 90 degree angle between the mounting plate and the top plate. This angle is critical because later when everything will be mounted on the mill, the XY table would be higher or lower on one of its sides. This would lead to problems when making accurate parts. Now since this is a welded construction, it is hard to get that angle perfectly square since metals tend to warp under the influence of heat introduced by welding. That's why the top plate is screwed into place. If the angle is a bit off, I can mitigate that by putting some shims under it. I then welded a piece of steel in the front and ground all weld beads visible to the outside down. A lot of drilling and tapping followed, but at least this is starting to look like something now. On to the next step then. This is a detail of the mechanism that drives the knee up and down. As you can see it consists of a shaft that will be turned by hand, two bevel gears that reorientate the rotary motion at a 90 degree angle and a ball screw. What we need now is a bearing seat for the axial load thrust bearing on the right. 
As raw material I used a 50 by 25 mm steel piece which I cut down to size with my angle grinder. It went straight on the lathe for boring. But why did I choose a thrust bearing? Thrust bearings can only take axial loads. The knee is fixed onto the carriages. So in my design all loads along the X and Y axis are bared by the four carriages. The thrust bearing takes all the loads created by the weight of the knee, the table, the vise and the workpiece. So there is a lot of weight. And that bearing is just meant for applications like that. As the next step I welded the bearing seat into place. Now I still need a way to mount the bearing housing for the hand wheel shaft. I wanted this shaft to come out at an angle, so the hand wheel won't interfere with the other hand wheel of the XY table. For that I cut a piece of flat steel to size and also welded it onto the knee. The housing itself is held in position via these two risers, similar to the ones I used at the belt drive. In order for the Z-axis mechanism to work correctly, it is important that the gears mesh nicely. To achieve that, the axis of the ball screw and the axis of the hand wheel shaft need to cross each other. To achieve that, I made these two jigs that both fit a drill. This jig is exactly the right diameter to fit the bearing seat. Now I can take the bearing housing jig, get it in a proper position and adjust the drills until both tips touch each other. With everything in the right position, I clamped the housing down and welded the risers into place. Then it was time to machine the housing. Once finished I immediately mounted it onto the knee. Although it's a rather tight fit, the housing will be secured in place via the bearing caps. Of course, they were the next parts to make. So this is the bearing cap, there are two of them. As you can see, I marked two lines on it where they will be cut later. The resulting edges will fit together with these edges on the risers. Once I was finished, the assembly looked like that. Next up was the shaft. For that let's take a look at my drawing once again. As you can see, on the right side I need to fit the small bevel gear and there are also the two bearing seats. On the left you can see the fixed bearing. If you look closely there are four rings in total surrounding the bearing. The purpose of them is to provide some kind of adjustability for the bevel gears. Let's assume the gears don't mesh nicely. By increasing the width of the rings on one side and decreasing the width on the other side, I can change the position of the whole shaft along its axis until the bevel gears work as intended. Off to machining then. I started by bringing the shaft to dimension, followed by machining the bearing seats. Then I cut an M12 thread where later the hand wheel will be mounted. Here you can see the shaft with the gear installed. 
It's held in place with a grub screw. I also machined the four fixing rings. Back to the shaft. Here are the two small rings. They will sit on the shaft like this. In between them, there is this bearing. All three parts will be secured with a circlip. To make the groove, I specifically built a tool out of an old drill bit. Let's do a test fit then. Well nice, just like I wanted it to be. Now it was time to put the shaft assembly together. If you're wondering why there are so many holes in the second bearing cap, it's just because it took me several tries to get the holes for the screws lined up with the threads. Well, happens. But overall the assembly looks good to me. Let's talk about the ball screw assembly for a bit. At number one we have the ball screw itself. Number two shows a spacer to get the gear onto the right position. Three marks the bevel gear. Number four also shows two spacers. At number five we have one of the thrust bearing rings. Six shows the bearing cage and number seven points at the second bearing ring. Now it was time to add the ball screw assembly to the rest of the table. As you can see, it works as intended. The next thing to do was the pipe in which the ball screw rides up and down. I had a perfect piece of scrap laying around, but it was too short, so I extended it. After painting it looked like this. At the bottom a piece of flat steel with a hole was added. Later there will be a screw inside which will be used as a mounting point for the pipe. Let's put everything together now. I started by mounting the knee onto the carriages. After that, the pipe and the ball screw followed. To reach the screw at the bottom, I used two extensions for my ratchet. The next part added was the ball screw. Also the hand wheel shaft assembly was added in this stage. Time for a quick test then. I'm so happy this works.
Next up I added the top plate. Once all screws were tightened, it was time to map the surface with a dial indicator. I got an error of around 2 tenths of a millimeter. To compensate for the low spots, I put some shims underneath. Then finally I was able to put the XY table in place. It also was mapped via the same method. After some shimming and 2 hours of adjusting, I finally got a result I considered to be ok. On the X axis I got a deviation of 2 hundredths of a millimeter and on the Y axis about 3 hundredths of a millimeter. The distance between the measured points is about 140 millimeters. I would say that's not too bad for a DIY machine. Well, time for the first test done. I still need a hand wheel, so I quickly machined one out of some bar stock. Then I just put it on the mill where I machined some flat spots. I mean you can tell it's not a Dactyl FB1, but it certainly does the job. After that I machined a grip for the hand wheel and put it onto the mill. This feels a lot better than a 19mm wrench. Well, the mill is now in working condition, which puts that video to an end. But don't worry, I won't stop there. The next video will be about some upgrades for the mill. Also, I need to test the capabilities of this machine further. Let me know if you liked it and as always, thanks a lot for watching.